Supervisor Joe Simidian, and welcome to the Beat Santa Clara Valley Healthcare's podcast. Hey, Nick, nice to be back. So glad to have you back again today, talking about something very important, as were the other topics, but today is going to be all about mental health services. Mm -hmm. Before we dive into that, for the people who are maybe just tuning into the Beat for the first time, can you give us a little background? on who you are. Oh, sure. I am County Supervisor, Santa Clara County Supervisor, Joe Simidian. Uh, I emphasize the county and county supervisor because, uh, frankly, a lot of folks have no idea what a county supervisor is or does. Uh, years ago, when I first ran for the Board of Supervisors, I had knocked on people's doors and said, hi, I'm running for supervisor. And one guy looked at me and said, I've already got a boss. I don't need another one and shut the door in my face. So I've, I've learned to say county supervisor so people know what I'm talking about. And, um, you know, I've served at five different levels of government now, Nick. I, uh, I started my public service as a member of the Palo Alto School Board, went on to be a mayor and council member in Palo Alto, did an earlier stint on the Board of Supervisors, then went off to Sacramento for a dozen years where I served as a member of the State Assembly and then in the State Senate. And when I was termed out, I thought, you know, the work at the county was tremendously satisfying and it was a very exciting time with the uh, coming of the Affordable Care Act and uh, so-called Ob Obamacare. And I thought, let me see if I can uh, find a way back there. I did. Uh, and so I've been back at the board now for 10 years. Um, grew up in the East Coast uh, for the earlier years of my life, raised by a single mom, and then eventually made my way to California. I lived with my dad and my stepmother, went to Palo Alto High School. And this area was really the place I was meant to be to become the person I was supposed to be. And so it's been it's been home ever since. It's funny you say Palo Alto and people have a certain uh, notion about uh, who you are and where you came from. Uh, you know, some other time I'll tell you about my uh, early years living in a government housing project. Uh, some other time I'll tell you about how I ended up incarcerated in the juvenile hall here in Santa Clara County. You know, when I grew up in Palo Alto, it was a genuinely middle-class community. Um, I went to, my dad was a teacher. Uh, I went to school with a best friend whose dad was a mechanic. Uh, our classmate was the custodian's daughter. And yet another classmate was the daughter of uh, Bill Hewlett at Hewlett Packard. Uh, and no one thought that that was an odd dynamic, that the CEO's kid was going to school with the teacher's kid, the mechanic's kid, the custodian's kid. One thing that uh, worries me a bit about the change is that that mix in terms of um, economics and income is uh, something I thought was healthy and that I, I miss, frankly, in our area now. It's a struggle. Well, I love that you are at home, serving your home, championing that diversity. It's always a joy when our paths cross, whether it's here at the hospital and also just weeks ago seeing you at a community tree lighting event. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. You are everywhere. <laughs> well, it's, you know, I have a district that includes all or part of nine different cities. There are 15 in the county, uh, but uh, I, I have a district that uh, has a number of the smaller communities. And each one's different. Each one's got a different community culture. Uh, each one has a different political culture. Each one has a different set of uh, challenges and opportunities. So I'm very clear about the fact that, you know, I got to get out and uh, be in the communities that I represent and hear firsthand from folks what's top of mind for them. Because, you know, while we do our work or much of it uh, at the county government center uh, or here at Valley Medical Center, the need is out there uh, in the places I represent. And, you know, you don't get out there, you don't hear it the way you should. Well, we are going to be talking about something today that is infinitely important, as we teased earlier, access to mental health care. Yeah. And whether that stems from you know, the hardships that people have experienced over the past few years with COVID or just mental health in general, which is always a need that needs to be really looked after. Can you tell us why you are a champion of mental health care and how you are expanding access to those in Santa Clara County? I think people, uh, unfortunately, think of mental health care as something separate and apart from, quote, health care. And, uh, you know, of course, nothing could be farther from the truth. I uh, when I served on the Board of Supervisors uh, many years ago with uh, then Supervisor Jim Bell, uh, I, you know, I really credit Jim with being um, an early advocate for uh, mental health care, mental health services, and making the case uh, for what we now call mental health parity. Uh, and uh, that term wasn't 
particularly in use or popular at the time. But, um, you know, years later, I am still remembering the conversations we had and the frustration that many of us felt about the fact that the healthcare world and certainly the insurance world uh, didn't always acknowledge that mental health needs were healthcare needs like any other set of healthcare needs and needed to be addressed and treated as such. And, you know, I think we've made progress, but not enough. Uh, we have some federal and state uh, law now on the books that says we get it. Um, but, you know, we don't always still see that sort of made real in terms of the way healthcare is delivered or certainly in the way uh, insurance uh, companies respond. So, you know, a big part of the push is uh, what we call mental health parity to make sure that people understand hey, if you've got healthcare needs in the mental health arena, you're entitled to get the help you need. Uh, and then uh, pushing beyond that, uh, I have pushed for uh, what we call uh, mental health for the missing middle. And, um, you know, as, as is the case with other kinds of healthcare needs, uh, I feel like sometimes folks who have uh, a tremendous set of uh, supports can get what they need, and folks who are covered by something like Medi-Cal might be able to access what they need. But for folks who are sort of caught in the middle, who don't make quite enough to have first-rate health insurance or access to first-rate providers, but who maybe make a little too much to be in a program like that, I want to make sure they have access to mental health as well. And so we've been pushing that uh, and have a program now uh, that um, allows folks who make, you know, up to Gosh, I think it's 650 percent of the federal poverty line, uh, which is, you know, a pretty pretty good number. I guess my message would be: if there's somebody out there who who needs the services, they should get the services, and we can find a way. I think in most cases to to get it. And then, you know, mental health for young people is just a whole other topic that uh, you know is uh, consuming uh, us and uh, really requires a great deal of thought and attention. And we're trying to do that. Well, when we talk about mental health care actualized, especially at the local level, and getting facilities in place, programs in place, recently you and I worked on a video together where we saw the demolition of a yeah. parking garage here at the Santa Clara Valley Medical Center campus. If you had ever told me I was going to put <laughs> a hard hat on for a demolition project uh, and stand in front of a camera, I would have said seemed unlikely. But, you know, as I said on that morning, uh, you know, before you can put something up, you got to take something down. And there was this aging parking structure. That's probably the politest way I could put it. That was uh, uh, ultimately, that is ultimately going to be the site of really what I think will be an extraordinary facility uh, to provide acute care, uh, mental health treatment uh, for uh, teenagers and kids who really need the help, uh, who are in a very tough way. And we we have not simply had that kind of facility here in Santa Clara County. And uh, it's taken too long to get to this point. And um, uh, my sense of urgency is uh, constantly tested and frustrated. But uh, it was a joy to me to see the bulldozers pull up and knock that thing down because I know that that's what's going to uh, allow us to put something up that will uh, really be a mental health lifesaver for uh, teens and younger kids. Well, we will have to link the video in this description because it's going to be a beautiful facility that is, like you said, very much needed with a backstory we hope to hear. Well, too. you know, again, uh, you know, it's so, so funny. Um, I, I, well, it's not funny. I, you know, I hear people say, you know, one person can't make a difference. Uh, absolutely not so. I, I was at a holiday party uh, in my first term on the Board of Supervisors and uh, one of the parents there pulled me aside and she said, can we talk for a minute? And I said, sure. And she said, why is it Santa Clara County doesn't have a single acute care bed for teenagers who are at risk of harming themselves? Uh, who, and I said, well, that can't be right. And she just looked me in the eyes and said, that's right. No, it, that's, that's what it is. And so I you know, came back to work and said, you know, what are we looking at here? And sure enough, you know, if there was a youngster who needed a secure care mental health facility, those kids were being shipped and, and are today, you know, to remote locations. Uh, you know, if they're lucky, there might be some place in San Mateo County, but more likely it's going to be Contra Costa County, Sonoma, even Sacramento. And, you know, these hospital stays are typically not long. They're six or seven days while things get stabilized. But 
you know, we're asking families to be separated from their kids at one of the toughest times in their lives. And, and that's not only, you know, incredibly challenging, but it has adverse healthcare consequences. You're pulling them away from their support networks. You're pulling them away from friends and family. You're pulling them away from their own mental health providers who know them best. And while I can't, you know, prove it with data, I, I'm pretty confident, uh, unfortunately, that uh, I think some families don't get the help they think their kid needs because it means separating themselves from their kid and putting them 100 miles away, and families are reluctant, understandably, to do that. So, you know, I came back to the county staff and made the case over the course of some time that this was a necessity. The county staff was uh, persuaded. Uh, then we uh, tried to uh, engage some of the larger players in the healthcare world in Santa Clara County to uh, you know, participate in what we call an RFP, forgive the acronym, a request for proposals. Um, bluntly, that didn't work. Uh, and then um, you know, I was uh, still determined, and so we sat down around the table. Uh, and to his credit, the county executive said, tell you what, why don't we take the lead on a facility on our VMC campus, Valley Medical Center campus, um, with partners from around the county. So Kaiser, El Camino, Stanford Healthcare, Lucille Packard. Um, and uh, we are now uh, ready to, you know, make that happen. Uh, that's the big hole. But it all started with one parent who took me aside at a holiday party and said, hey, how come? What she could not have anticipated is that the more I learned, the more convinced I was that she was absolutely right on. And to be clear, Nick, it's not even a function of uh, resources. You know, if there's no bed, there's no bed. So, you know, we have uh, folks at every income level who are saying, I can't find a place for my kid at this critical time in terms of their mental health well-being. And, you know, I know you know, but for, you know, some of your listeners who don't, uh, you know, all of this was made all the more compelling by virtue of some of the really uh, tragic suicides we had in not only my district, but in my hometown of Palo Alto. Well, it's tragic, yet remarkable that somebody in the community really came to you and said, we have a need and it's being actualized now. I think that's just absolutely incredible that there's this need, there's a solution to the need. I have worked with uh, you know, community groups, I'm thinking of Momentum for Health, uh, I'm thinking of uh, Project Safety Net, I'm thinking of Youth Community Services. Uh, these, are, these are groups that are, you know, local nonprofits that are uh, out there providing programs and services uh, that try to make sure it never gets to such a tough place. Uh, there's a program called Mental Health First Aid, uh, which is now uh, turned into Teen Mental Health First Aid which is about you know, helping teenagers understand how they can be supportive of their friends, how they can su spot a problem, how they can take some useful action, which usually involves engaging a trusted adult. So it's, it's a range of uh, programs and services and making sure that those are out there in the community. Uh, but as I said, I, I just, I, I wanna get us to a place where it is the rare, rare case where a youngster has to be, as I say, and, and I use the term quite purposefully, shipped out, because that's kind of what it turns into uh, when they really need to be close to home, close to their friends and family, close to their provider, uh, and uh, where no one has to hesitate uh, because um, the services are right here. Absolutely. We hope it never gets to the case where somebody has to be in a situation to be yeah. inpatient uh, for those mental health services, but we do also work and live in a place where we have amazing professionals to take care of them in their time of need too. Yeah, and you know, it's um, when you mentioned amazing professionals, I, I was thinking it. One of the other things that I think is um, heartening because I, I want to try and be upbeat on this uh, very serious and challenging subject is I think there is a greater awareness uh, of the importance in engaging the right professionals in the right circumstances, the right moment. I'm thinking now, Nick, of you know the work we've been doing at the county level that's been um, tough but very gratifying, which is to get mental health professionals out into the community, um, either uh, separate and apart from or in tandem with, excuse me, with law enforcement, 
uh, because, uh, you know, I think for years and years, um, you know, folks who had, frankly, mental health needs got themselves caught up in the criminal justice system in a way that sometimes had very tragic circumstances. As you begin to talk about the ways in which people in the community are cared for by mental health professionals, can you tell me a little bit more about mobile mental health crisis response programs in our county? Sure. I mean, at, at, at the most basic level, it's just about getting the right kind of help to the right place quickly as possible uh, and, um, you know, making sure that if the need is really for a trusted mental health professional, that's who arrives on scene. Now, sometimes that will be just the mental health folks. Sometimes it'll be mental health folks who are paired with law enforcement, depending on the nature of the call. Uh, and, and this requires a more thoughtful, deliberate, nuanced understanding of what's going on and what the need is. But, you know, we're working to make sure that the system can respond in that way. Now, taking a step back and talking about the youth again, I had the opportunity earlier this week, actually, to go over to Alcove, one of the Alcove locations, and take some photographs of the beautiful facility yeah. they have in Palo Alto. Can you tell us a little bit about what Alcove is? Well, again, uh, something that frustrated me because it took too darn long. I'll start there, and I, that's a kind of a recurring theme with me, and it reflects my... Uh, my sense of urgency, uh, even though I understand, you know, that systems take time to respond. Alcove is a dramatically different way of addressing the mental health needs of teenagers and young adults. And it is very much uh, youth driven, meaning that the participants, uh, sometimes clients, sometimes patients, um, drive the agenda in a way that is perhaps a little unusual. It all started uh, with, um, a uh, fellow named Steve Adelsheim, who uh, was relatively new to Stanford, I think, at the time. Uh, he called and made an appointment. Uh, you want to talk about mental health and young people? I was obviously open to that. He sat down on the couch in my office. We started to talk. He had a dramatically different model he wanted to pitch. I said, pitch away. Uh, at the time, uh, it was called Headspace. The name went through some changes. Uh, and uh, now it's Alcove. Uh, he had... Um, uh, looked at and worked with a, a program in Australia, uh, and I think Canada later was also a, a venue. And uh, he said, if we can create a place that doesn't feel laden with stigma and we let these young people and young adults engage and we provide a range of services, not just mental health, we're going to be able to change the experience dramatically and, and pull more uh, young adults and uh, teenagers in. And I said, I'm for it. Uh, I actually pursued some initial funding uh, at the county to kind of uh, serve as seed funding and get them started. Uh, and then, uh, to their credit, uh, the Alco folks, uh, Steve Adelsheim and his, his team, made the case for uh, significant funding uh, with and through the county and from other sources and uh, opened up two alcove sites, one in uh, the North County um, uh, in Palo Alto, and I'll come back to that, and then one in uh, San Jose. The San Jose site struggled a bit uh, because of location and the venue, and so uh, it's now operating uh, in a somewhat different way while uh, a new site is identified to sort of restore it to full-blown alcove status. The Palo Alto site that you visited, as you probably saw, is a, is a great venue, a great uh, location. It's a, it's a great location because it's on Middlefield near Oregon Expressway for those who know that area, which means that it's easy to access uh, for the surrounding communities in the North County or for anyone who just wants to hop on 101. Uh, but that being said, it's in the Midtown neighborhood. Uh, so there's a little shopping area there uh, close to um, really any part of the, the city and town as well as these other surrounding communities. Again, it's about embedding the services where they are needed. Uh, and, you know, look, we're, we're a big county. Um, I, I think, you know, you, why would you think about this if you're not part of the county world? But, you know, there are more than 3,000 counties in the country, and we are probably in the top 20 just in terms of population. And it is a long road from Palo Alto in the north to Gilroy in the south. So I am, you know, ever mindful that we've got to provide these programs and services where the need is, and that's out in the community. And um, 
you know, if I'm in a particularly prickly mood on any given day uh, in my office at 70 West Heading Street, I, I, you might hear me say, 70 West Heading Street is not the center of the universe because for the folks I represent, it's not. The services that they need, as I say, they need close to home. Um, and so if that can be in the schools uh, for young people, that's good. If it can be in a uh, neighborhood uh, that is just sort of part of the scene, that's that's good. Uh, I, I want to make sure uh, that we provide that, that range of services. So we've got the Alcove model going on. We've got some of these, um, you know, I'll call them prevention. And, uh, you know, the cliche, of course, is just say no. Well, that begs the question, how can you expect kids to say no to bad behaviors if they can't say yes to good behaviors? So you got to throw out some good behaviors and say, here they are. Here, here are, you know, Youth Community Services does a lot of work across county boundaries with uh, kids in uh, East Palo Alto, for example. And, you know, they've got a, an ethic of uh, volunteerism and community engagement, uh, public service that uh, I think, you know, is intrinsically worthwhile but I also think it helps keep those kids mentally healthy because they can feel good about what they're doing with their mm -hmm. teenage years. Um, so it's a range of things, uh, and it's uh, a project that will, quote, never be done. And uh, you mentioned the pandemic when we started. I think the pandemic has undeniably uh, heightened uh, our awareness of the problem and aggravated the problem. Uh, but let's not kid ourselves. The problem's been with us for a long time. And uh, I'm feeling optimistic that we're going to have a, a range of um, ways to address that challenge that, that just didn't exist before. Well, uh, it was very apparent driving you know, up to Alcove that it just, again, didn't look like a typical clinic. It was very inviting. It's definitely going to be a uh, center point for teens who need that preventative uh, care and someone to talk to, a great place to go and feel that destigmatization of mental health care, which I think is, is so important. Yeah, no, I mean, it, it's, you walk into Alcove and uh, the only way I can say it is there's kind of a happy vibe about the place. And you don't really think of walking into a mental health uh, clinic uh, and having a happy vibe, but mm. that's what there is at Alcove. And it's because the model is, uh, a different one. And uh, I think, um, you know, we're going to see more of these coming in San Mateo County right next door. I think the model has already proven itself. Uh, Santa Clara County will have been, you know, the first here in California, the pioneer mm -hmm. on this. Uh, but it's so heartening to see uh, that already folks at the state level have um, identified this as a model that sh should be and can be replicated. And as I say, we're going to see, I think, a couple of alcoves coming soon in uh, San Mateo County and perhaps more. I love that. There are uh, stepping stones, if you will, along the journey of taking care of people and their mental health from alcove to the incoming facility here on the VMC campus and in between. Is there anything that you'd like to leave the audience with today? I know you said mental health care has been something that we've needed to focus on for a long time. And is there anything you'd like to add to that? Well, just I want to go back to uh, where we started, which is um, mental health care is health care. And, um, and the law is on the books uh, to support that assertion now. And so, you know, you're entitled to get the help you need and, and deserve. And uh, if someone is a friend or a family uh, member can help provide that little push, I hope they do. As you point out, Nick, and I think it's a, a, there's this, you know, we call it a continuum of care in the healthcare world. Again, that's not a phrase I hear, you know, most uh, folks talk about. But, it, you know, in, in every instance, I would encourage folks to, um, get the help that they need. Uh, it's out there. Uh, it, it can be a difficult system to navigate, frankly, which is why I push for something called mental health navigators. Uh, you know, people said, what's that all about? When I, um, made the case at the board of supervisors level. And I said, I'm calling them mental health navigators because that's exactly what they are. They are, uh, folks who we now have at the County to help you navigate your way through what can be a very daunting, you know, system, as I mentioned earlier. Um, and, uh, you know, think of these mental health navigators as your Sherpa guide to the system. It's, it's, you know, it's a challenging system 
uh, just because it's complex, uh, but it's a particularly challenging system at a time of mental health crisis, right? So if ever you needed some help, it's then, and you want to make sure that people have that help. So the mental health navigators are there, and um, you know, if things do get to uh, a really bad place, you want to make sure that uh, the system can respond as well. So uh, it's why we ultimately, uh, with my support, approved uh, what folks commonly refer to as Laura's Law here in our county, because that was um, uh, part of that continuum of care that we talk about. Laura's Law, which, you know, our professional staff uh, refers to as Assisted Outpatient Treatment, or AOT, um, you know, is really a, a system that is designed to address folks who just otherwise seem beyond help. You know, you spot somebody out there on the street, they're clearly um, ill-equipped to take care of themselves, they're not ready to accept uh, help that is offered, and the question is, how can friends or family intervene? And um, for years, for 20 years, uh, we've had a law in the books that required counties to uh, opt in uh, that allows mental health professionals to work with the court system uh, to uh, compel, if necessary, some mental health treatment. And we don't want to go back to the bad old days when uh, folks were denied their civil rights, frankly, and their due process. But we do want to make sure that people can get the help they need. And if that requires, uh, you know, engagement by the courts as well as by our system, so be it. The law changed recently, and we were obliged to take another look at Laura's Law here in Santa Clara County because we had not opted in for years and years. Uh, the law changed a couple years ago and uh, the new law requires that you either opt in or make a formal decision to opt out and explain your reasoning in an open and public setting. And our county staff initially came to us and said, we want to encourage you to opt out again. And uh, my colleague and I on the health and hospital committee, uh, which I chair and Supervisor Otto Lee is the vice chair, uh, both said, you know what, we think we need to give this a serious look. And uh, we called in some uh, nonprofit professionals who were helping to make Laura's Law work in other counties, heard their stories. Ultimately, we were both persuaded that the uh, smart use of uh, assisted outpatient treatment, Laura's Law in Santa Clara County could and would benefit our county and we made the judgment to move forward. Was there a cost? You bet. Uh, and did it require some of our staff to kind of get out of their comfort zone? It did. It does. Uh, but Board of Supervisors ended up in the same place. Uh, we're administering that program now. And um, it's not a panacea. It's not a cure-all. It will be limited to a very uh, relatively small number of folks out there. But these are folks who are in a pretty desperate place and who really do uh, deserve the response. Some folks said, well, you know, I'm not sure you can compel or require. And it was interesting. Others had a different frame on it. They said, never mind compel or require. These folks are not getting the services they deserve. And, um, you know, unless you take this step forward, they're never going to get the services they deserve because they're not going to, you know, sort of walk in the front door and say, you know, can you give me some help, please? So, um, too early, I think, to, to have a conclusion about how uh, things are working here in Santa Clara County. But the experience in other counties, I think, has for the most part been good. And I, I think we absolutely made the right decision to say this is one more tool we've got to use uh, if we're going to deal with that full range of needs. Well, I think it's so heartening to hear that you really are prioritizing mental health. And it's invaluable. You know, there's a cost, but it's something that really needs to be looked at. People experiencing uh, mental health struggles as well as mental health uh, crises in, in particular moments. So we thank you for all of your work yeah. toward combating mental health, destigmatizing it, making uh, care accessible to all in mental health, as well as a range of other things that we really hope to have you on the beat again to talk even more about. I consider you a friend and you're a friend of the county, Supervisor Joe Samidian. Thanks, Nick. And thank you for the work you do to spread the word, because I think that is a, a critical part of making sure folks get the help that they uh, need and deserve. Mm -hmm.